Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. Okay. So, with that corner we stopped at and stayed for just a second. Right next to that is the traditional Garden of Gethsemane. But um, if we sing in there, they'll, they'll not like that. Um, so, I want to I sing a song, and this is a grove of olive trees. Uh, that one's just a little more, you know, it's next to a church and a little more. Uh, we'll walk through it. We'll walk through it after this. But I want to talk to you here. Um, I mentioned a few days ago the Bible never uses the phrase Garden of Gethsemane. That's, that's a phrase we have used. Um, the Bible calls it Gethsemane, and it says there was a garden nearby. Um, but it's not a garden of Gethsemane. And even the word garden is, um, you think uh, like an orchard, you know, it's an orchard of, of olive trees. So if you were thinking a typical garden, that's not, that's not what it would be. Um, Luke just says this happened on the side of the Mount of Olives. Uh, John calls it a cultivated plot or a garden or uh, an, an orchard. And then Matthew and Mark just call it Gethsemane. So the idea of Garden of Gethsemane is what we've come up with. <coughs> and probably partially because of what's down here. Uh, just a reminder from before, we I think we talked about this in Capernaum. Gethsemane. Uh, Gath means press. Um, uh, Shemin means olive oil, so olive press. Gethsemane just means olive press. So when it says that they went to Gethsemane, they went to the olive press. Um, and when uh, Luke says they went to the Mount of Olives, so somewhere on the Mount of Olives, in fact, because the olive, uh, olives were such a commercial production, there would have been a lot of uh, olive presses on the side of this mountain. And John calls it a, a cultivated plot. So probably there was this, this section, maybe it was fenced off with stone that was uh, of olive trees that a business owner ran his Gethsemane in this area and Jesus had a relationship with him. Um, so sometimes, oftentimes, the olive press would be in a cave if possible because uh, then you don't have to worry about rain. Uh, you're protected from rain. If you're able to do an olive press in a cave that's large enough that you can, you know, run, run that millstone around either by hand or by an animal. Um, I think I tend to think it was a it was a very specific place and maybe a specific owner of an olive press that had a very specific orchard of olive trees. Uh, we're reading Luke two. Let me just read to you. I'll get to Exodus, or Exodus six in a minute. But Luke twenty two thirty nine says this: Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. His disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said, "Pray with me that you will not fall into temptation." So it seems to me like there was a specific place they tended to go. And, and don't forget that, that Judas um, Judas gets paid 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. He knew exactly where to bring them to arrest Jesus. So there's a very specific place that when they would come and spend the night on the Mount of Oz, many times they went back to Bethany a couple miles from here. But other times it seems they stayed here on the Mount of Olives. That's why I tend to think and it, perhaps this Gethsemane was in a cave. Um, at times, so there's only a particular, a small season for uh, olive press during the harvest. You press olive. Then those who owned Gethsemane, especially inside caves, especially here on the Mount of Olives, would rent their cave to people that were coming for the festival. When you have every man coming to Jerusalem three times a year, you do not have enough housing for every man in Israel three times a year. So you get really creative. And people would take guests in. They all would have guests, not all. Many of them would have guest rooms. Uh, you know, even, even in Matthew 2, it talks about that Mary and Joseph, uh, there was no room for them in the guest room. There was a house in Bethlehem that had a guest room. There was someone already in the guest room. And people were coming in town for the census. So Mary probably just gave birth in the family room there. Um, but so people with house, people who were coming into town, but also someone who owned a Gethsemane, an olive press, if it was inside a cave, they would, they would charge a little bit of money and you and your family could sleep inside the cave 
So that's what I tend to think Jesus was coming to a place, a friend of his that owned a Gethsemane inside a cave, and they were staying there. This is the night that Jesus was arrested. Now, verse 41 then says this, he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, my father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So he asked God a question. He said, if you're willing, take this cup from me. I want to talk about what this cup is. Jesus had just come uh, from somewhere likely in the, in the upper city, perhaps. Uh, maybe it could be the lower city on the west side, but the south side, either the west side or the southwest side, uh, celebrating Passover. And in the Passover, um, there was a cup that he said, this now represents the new covenant in my blood. And there are, if, you, if you're familiar with the Seder, or the Passover, the order, and you've been through a Seder dinner, have you been through that? Okay, several. There are four cups of wine that you would drink. And uh, the third cup of wine is the one that Jesus would have said, this is the new covenant in my blood, drink it in remembrance of me. And then that fourth cup, remember he said, I'm not going to drink it until I, until I enter the kingdom. I'm going to drink this with you in the kingdom. So let, let's talk about those cups. Um, let's go to Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7. Now that word Seder means order. And this order of Passover, Seder, has re been relatively unchanged for like, you know, 3,500 years. Uh, and there's certainly been arguments between uh, rabbis along the way of should it be this or this, and we'll talk about that. But notice verses 6 and 7, I want to show you this. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. And then I want you to notice these, these four I will statements. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Number two, I will free you from being slaves to them. Three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people and I'll be your God. Then you will know I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the yoke of the Egyptians. So there were four I will statements they emphasized. I will bring you out. I will free you from slaves. I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm. I will take you as my own people. I'll be your God. So those four statements, they use the four cups of wine to represent those four statements. Until Jesus came, the biggest deal for the Israelites that they center their celebration on is Passover. It's when they were delivered from slavery from Egypt. So Passover is a huge deal. And so... There were four I will statements. The first cup of wine was called the cup of sanctification, the drawing out. It was to commemorate uh, them coming out of Egypt. The promise then is the first I will. I will bring you out. That's the cup of sanctification, being set apart, bringing out. The second cup is called the cup of judgment or cup of deliverance, and it relates to the second promise. I will free you from being slaves. It's the cup of deliverance, the cup of rescue, the cup of freedom third cup was the cup of redemption, where God said, I will redeem you. It's uh, I'll purchase you, but bought at a price. This is what when Jesus would have said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. That's the cup of redemption. The fourth cup is the cup of completion, when God would have said, I will take you as my own people. Cup of completion. You are mine. And that's the cup Jesus said he would drink when he was with them in the presence of the Father. That's when redemption would be complete. So those four cups were Four reminders of God's deliverance, what he did, what he's doing, what he's going to do. I'll bring you out, I'll free you, I'll redeem you, I will take you as my own people. Cup of sanctification, I'll bring you out. Cup of deliverance, I will free you. Cup of redemption, I will redeem you. And cup of completion, I will take you as my own people. Now, why that? Why is that important? There's a fifth cup that has been argued over a long time ago in history. The fifth cup that's poured at the Seder meal that's not, that you would not drink. It's the cup of Elijah, it would be called. And in the second century, uh, when setting up this official instruction for the Seder, there was a debate about this, this fifth cup, uh, based on probably based on the third promise. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. The question became, well, the redemption was for God's people, the judgment was for the Egyptians. So really that's two separate pieces. So they debated, should they include the fifth, the fifth cup in the Seder, in the Passover, because it wasn't for uh, the Hebrew people, it wasn't for the Jewish people. And they argued and no decision was made. Um, 
And I, I think it probably was over whether or not to drink it because it was a judgment for others, not God's people. So follow me on that. So they called it Elijah's cup. And when Elijah comes, judgment is coming. So the question is, before the, before the fourth cup, Jesus said that he wouldn't drink before the kingdom. He had drank the third cup. But he wouldn't drink the fourth cup until the return. So he drank the first cup, I'll bring you out. The second cup, I will free you. The third cup, I will redeem you. And then it also says there, and with mighty acts of judgment. That's to those who don't follow God. So now, all, all with that in mind, Jesus drank three cups. There's a fourth cup. There's a fifth cup, the cup of Elijah that you wouldn't drink because that's for God's enemies. Um, Mark 14 then says this. Mark 14, 32. They went to the place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. He began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. So he's overwhelmed to the point of death. This is, there's no hype to this. He means it. The sorrow Jesus has at this moment is so powerful and pronounced. He feels like he's dying in his human experience. And this is just hours before the cross. This is the most vulnerable we've ever seen Jesus in Mark 14. He's always so strong, so uh, so deliberate, so in control, and now he is so he's so human at this moment. And why is he distressed? Well, I think the answer is in what comes next. Verse 35, Mark 14. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass for him. Abba, Father, he says, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus wanted out here. And how did he ask? How did he ask to be taken away from this moment? He asked by saying, take this cup from me. What cup? To me, it seems, I, I would guess, he's talking about the cup of Elijah, this debated cup. It's the cup of judgment. It's the cup of God's wrath. And he is saying, by going to the cross, he is being asked to drink the cup of wrath that's reserved for God's enemies. And he doesn't want to drink it. That is the cup that's not touched in the Passover meal. It's the one between the third and the fourth cup. It's the cup of judgment or the cup of wrath. Now, this cup is mentioned a lot in the Old Testament. Let me just, if you're writing references, you can write this and look this up later. Jeremiah 49 is a, is a chapter about judgment on the um, Ammonites and the Edomites. And Jeremiah 49, 12 says this. This is what the Lord says. If those who do not deserve to drink the cup must drink it, why should you go unpunished? You will not go unpunished. You must drink it. I swear by myself, declares the Lord. Talking about a cup of wrath or a cup of judgment, you drink. Jeremiah 25, verse 15. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because the sword I will send among them. Here's another one, Psalm 75, 8. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth will drink it down to its very dregs. This is clear. There's a, clearly several references to the wrath of God. Now you'll start hearing all these competitions between the call to prayer here throughout the city. Um, and Jesus in the garden is saying, please, take this cup from me. It has to be the cup of God's wrath. And Jesus is saying to his father, could you please don't make me drink this? Because this cup is God's wrath on sin. And Jesus says, I don't want to drink it. I don't want your wrath on me. Don't make me drink it. I haven't earned this. I don't deserve this. And then Jesus quickly adds, but not as I will, but as you will. In other words, I will drink it. I will drink the cup of God's wrath, and he does. He drinks all of it down to the very throne. And he says, I will not leave a drop to drink it all. So, you see this? He offers to his disciples. He offers the cup of redemption. That's the third cup. And he drinks the fourth cup, the cup of wrath, before the last cup, the cup of completion. Um, and he drank the cup of wrath. And we drink the cup of redemption. And we drink it joyfully. We drink it thankfully. We drink it endlessly.
because the cup of God's salvation is always overflowing, the cup of redemption. And we can only drink the cup of redemption because Jesus drank the cup of wrath. When you drink uh, the cup of communion, and we're going to participate in communion together tomorrow at the Garden Tomb. When you drink the cup of communion, I, I'll remind you tomorrow, that the reason you can drink, that is the cup of redemption that Jesus offered to all of us. And the reason we're able to drink the cup of redemption is because Jesus drank the cup of the God God. And he drank all of it. And he invites us to drink it because he willingly, yet painfully, drank the cup of God's wrath. I, I always used to wonder, why does God say, take this cup from me? Why wouldn't you say, take this situation from me? Take this death from me. Take this terrible situation from me. Because it was a very specific thing he was talking about. Take the cup of wrath from me. The wrath that God pours out on sin, on sinners. And as you watch Jesus pray here in the garden, he went alone to a private place, and he had every right to look at all of us. In fact, every right, even at that last supper, where he was doing some loving things like washing feet. Um, he had every right to look at his disciples and he had every, every right to look at all us and point out that cup of Elijah, the cup of wrath, and say, drink this instead. And they never would have wanted to drink it because they said, no, that's the cup of wrath. That's the cup of Elijah. That's the cup of judgment. We're supposed to have the cup of redemption. But he had every right to look at us and say, you drink the cup of wrath because you've earned it. Jesus drank the cup of wrath not because he earned it. He drank a cup of wrath that we've earned. He drank a cup of wrath that we deserve. He drank a cup of wrath that he never should have had to drink. Because ultimately, God's wrath should have been poured out on each one of us, not on Jesus. And the only way we could have a right relationship with God, that we could drink the cup of redemption, and then eventually the cup of redemption, is if Jesus chose to drink the cup of wrath. And that's what he did. He freely took it and he drank it. And on that cross, God poured out his wrath on Jesus. And on that cross, well, we live in defiance of God, and God poured out his wrath on Jesus. We hated God, God poured out his wrath on Jesus. We rebelled against God, and God poured out his wrath on Jesus. We opposed God, and God poured out his wrath on Jesus. And it is our sin that makes the moment necessary that somewhere near here, certainly within a, a few hundred yards of here, that Jesus prays to his Father that night in the garden, can you please take this cup from me? And he quickly followed it up with, but not what I will, but what you will. And Jesus drinking that cup of wrath is required because of my sin and your sin. The cup that Jesus drank is required because of my pride and your pride. The cup that Jesus drank is required selfishness and your selfishness. The cup that Jesus drank is the only option for us to keep drinking the cup of redemption. And I think when we drink that cup of redemption, we should just be reminded that Jesus drank the cup of wrath so we could drink the cup of redemption. And the day will come where we will be in his presence where we will drink the cup of redemption with God. And we'll be able to celebrate Jesus for our sake drank the cup of wrath so we could be free. And that's what happened that night. So beginning with the Last Supper, when Jesus ate this meal with his disciples, he drank three cups, he refused to drink the last one because he had one more cup to drink. And he drank the cup of wrath by dying on the cross where the wrath of God was poured out on Christ. And now we will get to drink the cup of completion. So, before we walk down the hill and see what they call the Garden of Gethsemane. Again, we have no reason to indicate that it was there. One of the interesting parts of, it's nice when you're a Roman Catholic because the Pope will come and tell you this was the place. So it's nice, being a Catholic has advantages. So it's uh, Catholics that would believe it was there. Uh, we just, we don't know. But it was somewhere here that, uh, how did that Bible fall? Wow, that was awesome. The word of God can be painful, but that's not how it's supposed to be painful. So I want us to sing, uh, we're going to sing Jesus Paid It All. And I want you just to lift your voice and sing. We just heard a call to prayer to a God that doesn't exist. So let's worship the God who does exist. We paid a price we couldn't pay. Let's sing with great joy.